Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this Melbourne Cup Eve. I'm Margaret Anderson from the Old Treasury Building. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the Old Treasury Building stands on the unceded land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. A little bit of housekeeping first, although I'm sure you are now very familiar with digital presentations. This is a webinar though, so the host will have muted your microphone and only the speakers will be visible. If you'd like to ask a question, and I do hope you will, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screens. Questions can be anonymous using that uh, function if you want them to be. Any issues with sound or vision or to make a comment, please use the chat button. And I only ask, of course, that any comments are offered courteously. Now, it is a very great pleasure to welcome Dr. Andrew Lemon this afternoon and to thank him for joining us. Andrew is unquestionably the foremost authority on the history of horse racing in Australia. He is the author of the epic three volume History of Australian Thoroughbred Racing, the third volume of which was the joint winner of the Biennial Australian Society for Sports History Book Award in 2008. He has written many other books and articles on Australian history and just recently has ventured into the realm of fiction. We are promised that a novel will be appearing soon, perhaps in time for Christmas. Andrew is consulting historian to the Victoria Racing Club. And in his spare time, if he has any, he's held various important roles in an honorary capacity, including being president of the Royal Historical Society of Victoria. I can't think of anyone better qualified to speak to us this afternoon on the enticing topic, love it or loathe it, the Melbourne Cup and Australian history. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Margaret. And um, it's, it's usually a great pleasure to wander into the old treasury building itself and uh, have a look at the fantastic exhibitions that are there and uh, to meet people in person. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a uh, Edwardian character when it comes to Zoom. Um, I know you're out there somewhere and I hope you uh, um, can stay with us for the, for the rest of this lecture. Um, and I'm going to probably be a little bit discursive as we talk about uh, the Melbourne Cup and the story of it. Uh, tomorrow is the first Tuesday in November, by long tradition, a public holiday in Melbourne and much of Victoria. And I think this year, more than ever, eagerly awaited by a large proportion of the population. But I thought I should begin this talk with something that might mollify just a little anyone who is tempted to join us today because of the title, Love It or Loathe It. It is a historical fact that uh, the sport of racing has always had its detractors and sometimes for very understandable reasons. So I'll start with a commentary from an English paper reprinted in Sydney as far back as 1839, which predates the first Melbourne Cup by more than two decades. The source was London's Metropolitan Magazine, which called itself a monthly journal of literature, science and the fine arts, and which lived only in the 1830s and 1840s. And this was its view on, I quote, the evils of the turf, as reprinted in Sydney's Australian newspaper in December 1839. The turf is a most prolific source of social evil I am convinced it would be impossible to estimate the amount of mischief it has done to morals, to families, and to society. It first destroys all the better feelings of one's nature and then destroys one's fortune. Could all those that are still alive who have been ruined by the turf be brought into one place? What a vast and wretched assemblage of human beings would they present? The victims of the turf, why their name is legion. It is deeply to be regretted that when the results of betting on horse races are so disastrous, those races should be specially patronized by the queen. Of course, the blame does not attach to her, 
The subject is one which in all probability has never been brought under her consideration. She subscribes to the Ascot races and patronizes those races by her presence because her predecessors have done the same before her. But it is to be regretted that there should not be around those around her throne who would point out to her the frightful evils which are necessarily associated with the turf and suggest to her that she ought not be the patroness, either by purse or her presence, especially not by both, of a pastime which is productive of so much immorality and so much misery to individuals and families. I'm sure that were a sovereign possessed of such amiable feelings as is Victoria and who's, who is so exceedingly anxious to promote the cause of morals and to increase the happiness of mankind, uh, only aware of the deplorable and destructive consequences of horse racing, she would at once withdraw her patronage from that pastime. Well, there's something about Victorian prose, isn't there? And you might note a spot of condescension here, understandable if not forgivable, because Queen Victoria at the time when this was written was in just the second year of her reign, and she was barely 20 years old. But in fact, she always knew her own mind, and if those around the throne had suggested she withdraw her support for racing, they would have had another thing coming. From our end of the historical telescope, Queen Victoria is associated with Victorian era morality. You might think she disapproved of racing. She certainly came to take a dim view of her eldest son's gambling and horsey propensities later in her reign. But she was actually very keen on horses and racing, especially in the early years of her reign. Uh, there is an attractive book um, written many years ago by Dorothy Laird, which I'll show you. Oh, here it is. It's called Royal Ascot, a history of Royal Ascot from its founding by Queen Anne to the present time. And it tells some entertaining anecdotes about Queen Victoria's uh, early visits to, uh, to Ascot, including the day she um, broke the window because she was eager to see what was happening outside and she didn't realize the window was closed. Uh, it's worth exploring that topic a moment because you're familiar with the tired cliche of that racing is the sport of kings. With rare exceptions, English royalty has been keen on racing, certainly from the time of the Restoration and Charles II. If not the monarchs themselves, then sometimes their way with children. And this attracted the scorn of Republicans and Puritans because they saw raffishness, the decadence and the extravagance. Queen Victoria, on the other hand, always represented respectability. So, as I mentioned, she attended Royal Ascot, I think 1838 was the first time, and uh, she went to the Derby at Epsom for the first time in 1840, just after her marriage to Prince Alfred, who was not very keen on racing. Her early enthusiasm for the sport had a much more lasting influence than is often recognised, because if the Queen could go to the races and run a racing stable, and get enthusiastic about it, then society could, and indeed often felt it should follow suit. We see this reflected in Australian colonial society where it came de rigueur for the governors and vice-regal parties to lend their patronage to the big race meetings. The exception in this colony was our first governor, Lieutenant Governor Charles Latrobe, and I'm yet to find an instance of him ever attending horse races either in his role as superintendent of the Port Phillip district or as our first Lieutenant Governor. Uh, his time in charge was 1839 to 1854. So racing in Victoria had not yet, so to speak, found its level. And it is true that the reservation of Flemington as Crown land for racing purposes, rescued in the nick of time for sale as small farms in 1840 was achieved under Latrobe's auspices but certainly every subsequent governor of Victoria to this day and governor general since Federation has more often than not attended the Melbourne Cup. It's a long-standing tradition, not always inevitable that the state governor or governor general will present the trophy to the winning owner. There is a converse side to the notion of the sport of kings in Australia because part of the particular appeal of racing in Australia comes from its perceived egalitarianism. In England, apart from workhorses, the horse was owned only by the wealthy, 
In colonial Australia, the fast horse with stamina was soon ubiquitous in demand for transport, for agriculture and for sport. Uh, so every man, in a sense, uh, knew about horses and often had access to, to them. Uh, they knew an awful lot about, uh, about the horses in that time. Uh, the climate was conducive to successful breeding of such versatile horses. There were also newly wealthy men, not all of them aristocrats, who could afford to breed and race horses. So once we moved into that era of free settlement after the convict era, Whenever a settlement was settled by Europeans in Australia, a race meeting was bound soon to happen. Unlike in the USA, where the uptake of racing was patchy, in Australia, it was everywhere. It was almost always the first sport to be organised, often as a picnic meeting or an annual gathering in any embryonic country town. The notion, as expressed at the time, was that the cup as the greatest race of the year drew in everyone from the governor to the shepherd and the butcher's wife. I have a pet theory to explain why the Melbourne Cup has had such a stronghold on this city and its imagination since its first running in 1861. There are several factors at work, which I'll go through in a little bit more detail. But the chief one in my, in my belief is the timing. It is a November race, synonymous since the 1870s with the first Tuesday in November and a public holiday. Now, any Melbourneian who's had their head out the window in the last few days will concede that the weather as we lurch from winter into spring is changeable, vindictively so. Last week's proved it again. We fluctuate from chill gray days to wild storms from balmy breezes to blustery northerlies, cold southerlies, hail or thunderstorms. And between times, like this afternoon, we might find days of total perfection, just the right amount of sunshine and breeze. Tomorrow, we'll see. Every year, this year and last year in the literal sense, Melbourne emerges from its winter lockdown into the deceptive promise of spring. The Melbournians are Australian enough to want to embrace the first signs of real warmth and the great outdoors before the real heat of summer uh, tends to push us back inside again. From time to time, a new generation or those who are not Melbournians imagining themselves as original thinkers wonder why we don't run the cup in autumn or maybe closer to Christmas when they presume that the weather is more settled. But there are very good reasons why the first Tuesday is the right time. Not to labour the point, in the first week of November, let's generalise, the grass is green and fresh, the track not too hard, the roses are blooming, the horses are in fine fettle, and Melbourne, having taken itself seriously for months and most of the time indoors, is ready to party. From decades of precedence, Flemington Racecourse is programmed to be at its most attractive, its most receptive in the first week of November. And it's a fact that for most of the Cup's history, it is Flemington and its crowds who have been as much the draw card as the race itself. As a historian, I have spent years trying to unravel the nature of the hold that horse racing has had across his continents since the very early years of colonial settlement. The Cup is the symbolic, the quintessential Australian horse race the one that reflects all the others. And so it remains quite unlike any other race in Australia or the world for that matter, carrying its own legends and mystique. Times are shifting, attitudes change, but even in contemporary Australia, very urbanized as it now is, the cup remains a large enough focal point to bring Australians together to enjoy what they have in common. You may love or loathe racing as a sport, and the cup and all the palaver that accompanies each year, you may do your best to ignore it, but you can't pretend that the phenomenon doesn't exist. And as such, it is ripe for analysis, not just for the racing stories it generates, but also as a topic for the social and political historian. So the books that I wrote that Margaret referred to over a period of, of years that uh, covered the history of Australian thoroughbred racing from its uh, colonial and in fact its ancient origins through till 2007 
were conceived of in that spirit as social and political as much as the story of the races themselves. Not for, not for everyone, but there is a human need for ritual. And in the history of Melbourne, as it grew from settlement to town and rapidly to city, sport has been the theme of our secular calendar, sometimes deplored um, because there's a lot of intellectual life in Melbourne as well, and yet sport always seems to get the headlines. And just think of the uh, fuss that's made about Boxing Day tests, Anzac Day football matches, the grand final, the Melbourne Cup. Now that calendar doesn't remain ever unchanged. Um, much more media space and time in Melbourne is now devoted to Australian football than to racing. But the balance used to be the other way around in favour of racing, at least through, I would say, until the 1960s. The Boxing Day cricket test at the MCG is historically quite recent, although there is an old colonial tradition of grudge matches between New South Wales and Victoria on the Boxing Day holiday. Many people today would be surprised to learn that rowing on the Yarra, notably what was called the public schools head of the river, public schools in those days being what are called private schools today, was a huge day on the Melbourne calendar in the Edwardian years and through the decades between the wars. I suppose the big deal in Melbourne in recent years uh, in autumn, love it, like it or loathe it, is the motor racing Grand Prix. Uh, disappeared the last two years, but uh, the Melbourne Cup went on. There is an important, but not single explanation for why racing was, by most measures, the number one sport in Australia. Until the 1960s, and again, there are some minor interstate exceptions, gambling in Australia was illegal, although it was, uh, it flourished illegally. It was everywhere, but it was technically illegal except at race courses on race days. We saw slowly see an ebbing of, of a eroding of that uh, of that system, which is which is quite fascinating. As governments began to uh, universally realise that they could get money out of gambling as well as the bookmakers could and it changes the nature of legislation and of public attitudes. Um, but certainly the fact that you could gamble legally and you could go to the race course was one of the big factors for bringing large crowds to the courses, not just at Melbourne Cup time, but uh, around, the, uh, around the year. There are always three questions that I'm asked when I talk about the history of the Cup. First is why the Cup? not some other race. After all, it's the Derby in, in England and uh, the, the Grand National in England is the Derby in Kentucky, the Derby. Um, so that's the first question, why the Cup? Um, why the Melbourne Cup rather than the Sydney or an Adelaide or an Australian Cup? Why did Melbourne become the focus for this particular and peculiar race? And the third question is, did it start with a bang? Has it always been big right from the beginning? So I'm going to have a look at those three questions uh, in a little bit more detail. Well, why the cup? Because as you are probably aware, this is a handicap race. The conditions of the race have changed significantly over the years. So it used to be the case that the best horses in the race had to carry uh, often monstrously heavy uh, weights and that the uh, horses who were uh, uh, less, uh, less, less fancied could have very light weights indeed. The weight range has narrowed considerably. Uh, the bottom weights are not nearly as light as they used to be. The heavy weights are not nearly as heavy as they used to be, but it is still a handicap race, not a championship or a weight for age race. So some racing enthusiasts prefer races such as the Derby or the Cox Plate where the best horse should win because they're supposedly starting on an even, even terms. Uh, I won't explain the weight for age scale to, uh, to those of you who are not familiar with it, except to say that it's a way of trying to uh, make proper allowances for the age and sex of horses to ensure that they are in effect all starting on equal terms, 
And that's what the, um, what the Cox Plate, for example, or other weight for age races do. Uh, races like the Derby uh, are set weight races where all the uh, colts and buildings carry the same weight, but in the cup, they don't. So it's a handicap race. And I think that this is one of the secrets of its success because it appeals to that gambling instinct, which just runs deep in the Australian character, maybe from the convict days, certainly from gold rush days. In fact, everybody who has come to Australia um, and started families here has in a sense uh, taken a risk, taken a gamble. Sometimes the gamble was one they didn't mean to take. Um, so I do think there's some truth in this idea that there's a propensity in the Australian character uh, to uh, occasionally uh, have a gamble. Now the cup also offers two psychological um, hooks, if you like, maybe they're props. It offers the chance to the underdog. It says that the long shot might get up and win, and it might just enrich you in the process. But there's a converse side to this, which is that the true champions, such as Carbine, Farlap, Maccabi Diva, might be able to carry more than their fair share of weight and yet still be able to win. And that seems to answer a deep emotional need. Um, so we're prepared to, to cheer the champions. And I can certainly, I'm not old enough to have seen Farlap, I am. Uh, old enough to remember Maccabi Diva winning, and I remember people uh, who had backed other horses to beat her uh, actually were cheering for her to win because that was a, a, one of those great sporting moments, the equine version of Cathy Freeman at the Olympic Games. So I think that there are those two things that happen. There's that opportunity for you to back the 101 horse and win, or maybe see that champion uh, prove it's a champion. The second aspect to that is that you might be able to outsmart the experts because only rarely do the hot tips win the race. The experts nearly always don't get it right. Um, there'll be a lot of different opinions uh, out there. Very occasionally, the, the favourites um, will get up. Um, but, um, and there are lots of people who are wise after the event, but not beforehand. There is an industry now, and there used to be an equivalent industry in earlier days, but these days it's internet bookmakers and betting outlets with their garish advertisements busily luring the wary and the unwary into punting on the result and offering that dream that maybe this year your bets, your Cornelli, your trifecta or your first four will come in and solve your financial worries. Or maybe it'll just give you a chance to have a little win. Uh, the, the boundaries are uh, are often quite hard to uh, define. You draw an apparent no hoper in the family or offer sweepstake. Maybe it's Prince of Penzance written by Michelle Payne who will win at 100 to one. So why is it the cup that's this important race? Partly of course, because it's rich. It always has been a rich race. It's not always the richest race in Australia. Uh, there have been times in the past, and at the moment, uh, there's a race, the Everest in Sydney, which is richer, but it's pretty inscrutable to anybody who's not in the world of racing as to how a horse gets in it and what they're meant to do to win it. There just seems to be a very big prize there. But the cup is a little bit more explicable, and it is worth a lot of money in stake money. And in the old days, of course, there was a great opportunity to, for uh, owners to uh, reap a windfall through, uh, through their bets. And the third point about the cup is that the history and tradition become part of a self-perpetuating story. So it really is the race that Australian jockeys, trainers and owners dream of winning. And although they'll be thrilled when they win other big races, uh, they really uh, do. And I can say this from first-hand experience of talking to them. They, they feel that they've um, achieved something in life um, by winning that particular race. So when I'm talking about why the Melbourne Cup and why not somebody else's cup, uh, my answers have always come down to the three Gs. It was a slightly naff expression when I first thought it up a long time ago, but it's, I think it still works. And the three Gs are um, geography, gentlemen, and gold. Geography, I started off with the climate. Um, so we've covered that side of it. Uh, Melbourne's geography for an Australia-wide race, especially in the days before 
air transport. Um, Melbourne was the geographic centre of Australia um, insofar as it was the easiest central meeting point for each of those states. And I think the fact that Melbourne became the de facto capital of, of Australia until Canberra was open for business in the 1920s is another um, example of that. New South Wales has always been the predominant state for the breeding of thoroughbreds in Australia, but Victoria has also always had an important place in that industry. And of course, it has a generally temperate climate. And of course, Victoria is a compact state by Australian standards with a large population, uh, regions having ready access to the capital, especially by rail. So you see Geelong, connected to Melbourne in the 1850s, Bendigo in the 1860s, and much of the rest of the colony in the 1870s. And there was absolutely no question that the railways boosted the attendances at Melbourne Cup because it came, became possible for people to come down uh, easily to, uh, to see the big race. And the more they read about it, the more they wanted to see it. My second G in my GGs um, is gentlemen. Well, gentlemen, there's a very loose descriptor when it comes to either racing or colonial Victoria, but really I wanted to point out the great importance of those first 15 years of European settlement in Port Phillip district before the gold rushes. This so-called pastoral period was not pastoral in the Beethoven sense of uh, sheep safely grazing. We recognize it as a time of Aboriginal dispossession and the environmental impact of the newly imported animals onto a pre-European landscape, cattle, uh, sheep, horses, and of course the mining that, that followed that. There may have been many Vandemonians or New South Wales ex-convicts as shepherds, but the first squatters and pastoralists, many of whom might answer to the label wild colonial boys, quite reckless as young men, took the first steps towards alienating into their ultimate possession, large tracts of land. This was disproportionately a male population. Many of these men came with capital and expectations. And historians in Victoria are always indebted to Paul de Serval for his careful analysis of the self-described upper classes in 19th century Victoria in his books on the subject. It's largely this group of men who, while often arguing amongst themselves, set up the first race meetings in Victoria. There was some sort of horse race or races in Melbourne in 1837, uh, two years after the town was settled. And in March 1838, a first recognizable race meeting on the Docklands flat below Batman's Hill uh, near the Docklands Stadium as it is today, uh, was, uh, took place. And Flemington saw its inaugural race meeting two years later in March 1840. And this became the Melbourne race course. It's been in continual use for this purpose for more than 180 years. It was in the, in the 1840s that the first embryonic racing clubs emerged here with rules that both reflected and in some ways satirized English racing of the day. So by the time the gold rushes came along and the influx of population, Victoria already had in place a system of reasonably well-regulated racing according to the standards of the day. The final G in that group was gold, gold equaling money. Racing showed what other sports have followed, not necessarily for the public good, that money can make or break a sport. The Melbourne Cup begins exactly a decade after the first public discovery of gold in Victoria, and it coincides with the um, news that comes to Melbourne of the uh, deaths of Burke and Wills in 1861. The um, population in that period grew from about 77,000 to more than half a million. And Melbourne and suburbs accounted for a quarter of that number. And let's remind you that that half million grew to three quarters of a million by 1871. It was a huge increase in population. Well, again, generalizing, Victoria's uh, found itself, Victoria found itself enriched by gold mining. Many individuals made and spent fortunes. That meant prize money for the big races was large in Victoria. And with that came a boom in gambling with racing as its focus.
two things marked the development of racing in that gold rush era. The first was a series of intercolonial challenges, which were called match races in the day. We Victorians, or one or two wealthy individuals, uh, threw down a challenge to the New South Welshmen to send their best horse down here to race against ours. And there were several such events, uh, most notably between the Churnside's mayor, Alice Hawthorne, who was named after an English champion, uh, and the Sydney horse, Vino. The Cornstalks, as the New South Wales people were called, won the day. But the, um, the event and similar contests started drawing very large crowds uh, of the curious to the Melbourne race course to witness these much publicised events. Now in 1859, this concept was extended as the Victorian racing gentlemen combined to provide a race or put one on called the Australian champion sweepstakes. Sweepstakes meaning the winning owner sweeps all the stakes and the added money into his pocket. This race held at Flemington in September 1859 attracted entries from the other colonies, especially New South Wales, Tasmania and South Australia. But it also attracted a great deal of betting speculation because there was a long lead up to this event. Um, it wasn't a handicap, but there was a lot of speculation. I think the race was a three mile race as well. So it was um, a lot of speculation well before the race itself. And it was fueled by the growing newspaper coverage in each of these colonies. And I want to mention the appearance of the specialized sporting papers, Bell's Life in Sydney, which ran from 1845 to 1870, and Bell's Life in Victoria, which began in 1857. The combination of an international or an intercolonial uh, grudge race between uh, New South Wales and, and uh, well, in fact, all of the states, plus the rare spectacle of a big field of top class racehorses, plus the betting speculation meant that a huge crowd attended the meeting. Uh, tens of thousands, uh, some put that is as many as 40,000, which probably a bit, a bit exaggerated, but it was a very large crowd came to watch that race. Um, and the, uh, uh, it was the inauguration of the first uh, telegraph between Melbourne and Sydney was uh, the telegraph office was opened at Flemington to allow the result to be uh, conveyed immediately to Sydney. Uh, and they didn't like the result because a Victorian horse won. Um, there was certainly drama in the, uh, in the lead up to that story for one of the Adelaide horses entered for the race had miraculously swum ashore when the ship on which he was traveling to Melbourne, the Admella, was wrecked off the coast of South Australia. It's one of our more dramatic Australian shipwreck disasters. It involved terrible suffering, loss of human life, and an amazing heroic rescue of the survivors by the heroes of Portland. But the horse, the barber, uh, swam ashore, um, unscathed. Uh, he was taken in hand near the beach, recognised, um, subsequently was walked effectively from Mount Gambier as far as Geelong, uh, and he was put on the train uh, to Melbourne and ran in the race. I often say that in a fairy story he should have won, um, but the fact that he even ran in the race is amazing, and he did subsequently win a race at uh, Williamstown. So I see this race and the intercolonial interest that it sparked as the foundation for the national appeal of the Melbourne Cup. So zooming on a little bit, uh, we see a decade of transition in the gold rush period that takes us through to that first Melbourne Cup. The 1850s saw Flemington Racecourse placed in the hands of trustees who made progressive improvements. And we see the proliferation of race meetings in regional centers including Geelong, Bendigo and Ballarat, uh, a growing interest in the, the sport focused on Melbourne. We also in this period see the arrival of, very, of a number of very key um, individuals in Victoria. Uh, I could mention just a couple. One is Anthony Green, who was a, uh, an actually a very accomplished veterinary surgeon who started the first professional training operation and advertised for customers. Um, he won several races as a trainer, uh, was brutally murdered by uh, an irate jockey, um, not, at the, not at the races, uh, and that was the end of, of his extraordinary career. Uh, much more long-lasting was George Watson, 
who uh, was also involved in Common Co in Kirk's Bazaar in selling horses in starting races at Flemington. He was a great entrepreneur and a very significant figure coming out from, uh, from Ireland in the 1850s. Many of our early jockeys and their families also, uh, you'll find that they immigrated and arrived in Victoria in that 1850s period, uh, some of them having long subsequent careers. We also see in the 1850s, in that decade before the Cup, uh, the, the attempt to set up local classics, um, which loosely described as Derby, Oaks, St Ledger, but the fields were not very big, the betting wasn't all that big, and that is a factor in why the Melbourne Cup um, became so attractive. So I mentioned there were rivals in Melbourne in the 1850s. And in fact, there were two rival uh, racing clubs who raced at Flemington. Um, they competed in the period from 1857 and they both tried to get a big race up that would attract the, uh, the, best, uh, the best audience and the best fields. So in the 1860s, um, the local jockey club tried a race that they called the 2000 Guineas, again, named after the English classic. Um, and the Turf Club um, invented the Melbourne Cup, loosely based on the Chester Cup in England. I used to suspect that this was an apocryphal story, but contemporary um, sources say that it's true that uh, the slightly rakish Chief Commissioner of Police, Frederick Standish, who was involved in that early racing, uh, had the idea and put up that proposal, and it worked. So the 1860s, after this first Melbourne Cup CA, a makeover of Flemington Racecourse, the finishing line uh, is moved to be parallel to the hill. It used to be parallel to the river, and that allowed for spectator use of the hill. And much of this hill land was not in the Crown Grant, but a quarter century later, the BRC was able to acquire extra freehold land to extend the hill reserve. And I think the hill is one of the key ingredients in the success of Flemington, because the place is a natural amphitheater, but the fact that you could go up on the hill and get a fantastic view in the days before broadcasts, in the days before binoculars, uh, it was possible to view the race from the hill. And um, although most of the hill is occupied by grandstands today, the hill is still the best place to see the race from. So was the Melbourne Cup a big deal from the start? Well, it was big enough because it was built on the success of the 1859 race. Now it wasn't part of the plan, but having a New South Wales horse Archer win the first two cups and to be recognized as a champion really helped matters along. It started the, um, the mythology around the, uh, around the racing. Uh, if anybody is still unclear of this fact, uh, Archer did not walk to Melbourne to win the Melbourne Cup, he did come on a ship. But um, he was a champion horse and he did win those first two Melbourne Cups. And uh, the fourth cup was won by a horse whose origins were in South Australia. The sixth cup was won by a New South Wales champion, the Barb, the next by a Sydney horse. New South Wales won again in 71 and 72. And this boosted interest enormously in this race in the older colony. And it led to many Victorian horses going to race in Sydney. And so it became a focal point. By 1873, uh, possibly earlier, we had the spectacle of three colonial governors deciding that they had important business in Melbourne around about Melbourne Cup time. Uh, so again, you start seeing this social side of the racing very strongly uh, coming uh, uh, in, in hand in that period. Flemington then, as a race course, became the attraction in many ways. So you've got the race and you've got the place. I mentioned the hill and the improvements to Flemington. The two rival clubs effectively sent each other broke. And in 1864, they dissolved and a compromised club emerged. And this was the VRC, Victoria Racing Club, which continues to this day as the trustee or holder of the Crown lease and which until around 2000 was officially recognized with legal powers as the principal club in Victoria. As time went on in the colonial period, the VRC exercised increasing powers over such things as the licensing of jockeys, trainers, stewards, or officials, new race courses, the eligibility of horses, 
the planning of the racing calendar. The club was the body that interpreted and enforced the rules of racing in Victoria. It presided over protests, could impose disqualifications, warn people off the race courses. Now, each Australian state, um, particularly since the 1990s, uh, around the 2000 period, now has quasi-state government appointed bodies, uh, such as Racing Victoria, to exercise these powers. And it's partly a reflection of the fact that that racing became so significant as a sport being called an industry uh, to the uh, economy of those particular states. Uh, so it's not direct control, but it is arm's length control through bodies such as Racing Victoria and Racing in New South Wales. The VRC, meanwhile, as the richest and oldest racing club in Australia with this uh, amazing tradition, now confines itself to controlling Flemington and the races that take place there, including the Melbourne Cup. Uh, well, Flemington was <clears throat> much larger than any other race course in Victoria. Uh, it had enough space originally for a secondary training track, um, and it's, it occupies the river flats of Flemington, and it's only in recent decades that stabling has been built on the course itself. Um, it was a flood-prone area and now has some uh, protection from flooding, uh, but for much of the history of the race course, it was the surrounding streets of Flemington, Kensington and Ascot Vale, where the Flemington based horses and the trainers lived and they had their stables and the whole area was peopled by jockeys and stable hands, farriers and so many others who made their living from the sport. Um, it's still possible to um, do a little bit of a forensic walk around some of the back streets and of, uh, of surrounding Flemington, and the horses would take their the trainers would take their horses in the morning down to gallop on the uh, Flemington racecourse and then lead them back through the streets. Very similar arrangement around uh, Caulfield as well, which uh, was also a training centre um, in those days without uh, stables on the tracks themselves. Flemington and the VRC have two heroes from the 19th century who found their way into the Australian Racing Hall of Fame as what's called associates. Neither of them had much interest in the sport, but they were practical visionary engineers or entrepreneurs who wanted the place to be wonderful. And they are Robert Baggett and Henry Byron Moore. Baggett became the VRC's inaugural secretary or CEO in 1864. And he was poached because he had already done wonders at the Melbourne Cricket Ground uh, to provide a well-mannered playing surface and attractive surrounds uh, there. So uh, he put his talents to work not just on the track at Flemington, but also on the facilities and amenities. Uh, he built in 1873 Flemington's first grandstand that was really worthy of the name. There had been previous stands. Uh, it was disparagingly known for many years as Baggett's Cowshed because it had a rather long and agricultural look about it. But it was in fact a very elaborate grandstand built on, uh, um, on uh, very solid bluestone foundations um, to make sure it was secure in that flood prone soil, uh, providing sufficient elevation and protection and facilities for uh, the racegoers who were prepared to pay more to come into the track. And yet its height had to be limited so that the people on the hill could see over the top of it. Uh, and again, it's, it's interesting for those who enjoy their architectural archeology span to recognize that the, uh, there's still a place called the Hill Stand at Flemington, which basically is on the footprint of Baggett's car shed of 1873 with various other large stands uh, around it and above it. The um, secretary was always answerable to a powerful VRC committee, a prestigious body, but both Baggett and Byron Moore wielded great influence. So Byron Moore is again a fantastic um, Victorian character. Uh, he took over in 1881. He stayed in office for 44 years. He was in his 80s when he finally retired. And in his time in office as uh, the um, uh, as the secretary of the VRC, he, um, he was just a, a great promoter. 
Um, Bankit had a bit of this as well, but uh, Byron Law was was more he was a bit more suave, I think. Um, and uh, so he would always be promoting the attraction of Flemington itself. Uh, they graded the lawns, they beautified the place, they planted gardens and trees. Byron Moore was a horticulturalist. Um, he was, um, every racing season, he would issue these fantastic two column advertisements in the, in the press, which went interstate as well, really making Flemington sound such a marvelous place that if you came to Melbourne, you had to see it. And if you hadn't come to Melbourne, you had to come to Melbourne and see it. And um, I think that, that he also had this terrific capacity to um, add something new and exciting every year. It might be a, a new stand, a refreshment room. There'd be novelties and conveniences, a Swiss chalet, um, a, a place where you could buy oysters. Um, there were fountains, there were, there were grottos and glades. Um, there was, of course, the, the tree planting that uh, made, uh, that was synonymous with Flemington, the elms and um, the, uh, the beginnings of the roses that uh, now are a feature of the place. And I think Bagot um, is credited, I think correctly, with introducing the idea of giving the male members of the uh, club, and it was a male organisation, two free tickets for ladies. And of course, with the social cachet of the governor and high society coming, Flemington became a place to see. Um, Margaret was kind enough to, to mention my, my new novel, which is in fact, um, I give myself a shameless plug. If you go to Australian scholarly publication and look for the pebbled beach at Pentecost, you'll find it uh, just about ready to, uh, to come to your door. And it's based on a series of letters. Um, it is a novel, it is a fiction, but it's based on a series of letters written by a young man who, who uh, came from Wolverhampton to, to, um, to Melbourne in the 1870s. And uh, he goes to the Melbourne Cup in 1876. And uh, no, it would be 1878 and 1879. And uh, he, he loses his five shillings, but he tells his mother in his letter home that the, the ladies' dresses were worth coming to see. It was, it was a spectacle. Sydney looked down its nose on this rather um, uh, they used to think that that, that uh, had that wonderful expression, tinsel trash was being worn at Flemington, a waste of uh, a waste of money, um, and all the all the gambling and everything went it, went with it. But Melbourne seemed buoyed by this uh, by the excitement of this this race and this event, and it became a place to see and be seen. And so Byron Moore, in his period from from 1881 for the next 44 years was always keen on making people think they had to go to Flemington to see the latest invention. It might be the starting machine of 1894. He had a wonderful idea of having a, an electric uh, grandstand that would whiz around the inside of the race course. It might happen one day. If I had more time, and I will come to a conclusion now, um, there are two things that I would talk about. One is the influence of, of media um, really changing over the years, but, but always very important. And a lot of that media, um, particularly in the period of radio and um, tabloid newspapers, uh, subsidised in ways that we will probably never know by the uh, off-course betting industry, because after all, that was the way of keeping the, uh, keeping the things turning. Uh, the other topic, which would be something for a seminar on, it, on its own, would be the evolving attitudes towards animals and equine welfare. Uh, and um, they're, they're both extremely interesting topics. Um, I've always felt that, uh, and I've had the, um, the privilege of, of going around uh, on some of the, uh, the Melbourne Cup tours where the trophy is taken around Australia, uh, and showing it to people and realizing that uh, for all the hype and all the, um, the stuff that, that is less attractive about, uh, about racing, there is a great affection uh, for horses, a great enthusiasm for this as a, as a kind of unity of, uh, in, in Australia. And um, I think that that is something that's, that's really uh, is significant. So I'll change, I'll, I'll conclude with, a story of a minor scandal, um, a long shot 
local grey gilding Tory boy with a lightweight, written by what I'm now I'm absolutely certain was a 12 year old boy, John Kavanagh, won the fifth running of the Melbourne Cup, narrowly beating the expensive, important, imported, magnificent stallion panic. Tory boy had passed through the hands of several owners and has raced at the time of the race by an English publisher briefly in the colonies named BC Marshall. Marshall wins a large silver trophy, the first ever awarded in the race, and large stake money. But it seems that in the course of race week, it made several large and unsuccessful wages. Reluctant to pay these amount, he sells the horse and the trophy for ready money. He feigns drunkenness. He reluctantly writes a check that he knows will bounce and prepares to skip the country. Alas, his plan is thwarted and the case is much publicized in the press. So then Bell's life in Victoria that I mentioned was deeply offended by the denunciations made in town of racing as a low sport. One bad apple, it declares, most racing people are men of the world and remember this, like most sports in this day, a male dominated game, but they, it, Bell said they were, they were men of their, men of their word. And Bell's took umbrage in these terms, which takes me back to where I began with Queen Victoria. Bells wrote, there is a class of persons possessing the most superficial acquaintance with the habits and characters of sporting men and strongly prejudiced against their pastimes and pursuits. To this class, horse racing is a satanic device, the race course, a pandemonium, the betting ring, a congregation of sharpers and blacklegs and the frequenters of such amusements are on the high road to perdition. Well, it was a, Fair point, not everybody was as shifty as BC Marshall, but his outrage at generalizations I don't think would pass muster with my old exercises in Tracy and clear thinking in the days when I sat my matric English expression, because well, Bells went on to savage the opponents of racing in these terms. They are Puritans. The old spirit of Puritanism, which took its rise perhaps among men suffering from weak digestion and enlargement of the spleen, a torpidity of the liver or a general moroseness of disposition is as vital and active as ever in the 19th century. And in this out of the way corner of the world, it manifests itself quite as frequently in a social as a religious form. It is harsh, malicious and uncharitable. Well, I guess that's a generalization about people who loathe the Melbourne Cup and horse racing maybe some of the other generalizations about it being the refuge of scandals and um, the uh, the end of morality as we know it uh, they might also have a point um, but um, whatever happens tomorrow there will be a party uh, maybe maybe premature but i think we we deserve it in melbourne and uh, the melbourne cup uh, writes a new chapter in a very strange and uh, amazing history thank you very much Andrew, thank you. That was just a wonderful lecture. And uh, you did everything you said you would, actually. You, you <laughs> talked about racing, you talked about social history, political history, um, Melbourne and the rest of Australia. So fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, people have started to put some questions into uh, the Q&A. So if you do have a question, um, please type away and Andrew will do his best to answer them, I know. But there is one in there already, Andrew. Mm. Um, it says, is the Melbourne Cup now seen as more of a national horse race by the other states? And if so, what led to this change? It was fascinating to see uh, very early usage of uh, headlines in, in colonial papers, calling it Australia's great race or the great race of Australia. Uh, and I think that a long time ago, um, the, the VRC realized that it had moved, the race had stopped being just a, a staying race at Flemington and had this other other association. Uh, now it it um, I I think in some ways that I've also argued that it probably had a role in making people um, be attracted to the idea of federation. I mean, sometimes I don't know if, if this is a long bow, but I think that in terms of finding those things that make people say we are actually Australian as against we are 
in our different colonies. And I think we've, it's really interesting the way we've had to relook at that in our COVID experience, because suddenly the states were reinvented in a way that they just haven't been around for a long time. And as we start to argue as to whether, you know, people in Melbourne see the world differently from, from people in, in Queensland, um, I think that, that we do also look for those things that, that bring us together. So, um, so again, I'd refer to my, um, the answer that when I've, when I have traveled with, with the Melbourne Cup, um, and look, it's a, in a sense, it's a promotional exercise by the, by the racing club. But when you actually go to uh, nursing homes, hospitals, um, if you take the cup to, to schools and the, and the kids will be excited because they'll be excited if anything sort of gold and glossy comes into, into the school, but, but then it'll be the teachers and the, uh, uh, the teachers, the, the mums and dads, who parents who just feel that they have to hang around for a little bit longer and, and see the stories. And um, when you see the, uh, uh, the emotion that's, that's attached to that, uh, it's, it, it has brought home to me that it, it, it is um, a national race. And I think that, um, so what's led to the change, I, I, I see it as, as that evolution. In some ways, I see the seeds of it right back in that Australian champion sweepstakes, where it's both competition, um, rivalry, um, but also a sense that we're, we're all in this together. Um, so I hope that that's, um, that's a reasonable sort of um, answer to that question. I think more than reasonable. Yeah. And I was um I was thinking while you were talking and particularly thinking about some of the associations of uh, racing and gambling and mm -hmm. all the moralizing that went around it. Why was it that gambling was allowed at the races when it was not allowed anywhere else? Well, look, I think it's to do with you you really um Governments at, at times realise that there is a limit to what can be done. And in Melbourne, um, one, of the, one of the studies that I did years ago, in fact, it was uh, my, one of my first books, which had its origins as, as, a, um, as an MA thesis, was a, uh, a life, a, a biography of the Honourable James Balfour, MLC. Now, James Balfour was described uh, memorably as the keystone of the whole Wowseristic edifice um, he belonged to the group of Presbyterians who wanted to make Melbourne a moral place. Mm -hmm. And so there were lots of laws that came into effect in, in Melbourne that tried to regulate uh, all sorts of what were seen as, as evils. And they might have involved trying to reduce the number of hotels uh, to introduce things like, like prohibition or uh, early closing. Uh, to have Sabbath observance to stop places like the National Gallery from opening on Sundays uh, <laughs> and to stamp out gambling. But there is a point at which the society is going to say, no, this is, this is what we do. Um, and so they would move towards the idea of, of regulation rather than, than prohibition. Um, and so for me, it, it's a very fascinating part of Australian history to see the, as I mentioned, that, that shift as uh, through inventions like the totalisator machines and so on, where, where governments started to say, we could, um, uh, we could get into this. And I talk about, um, in one of my chapters, I think I talked about New South Wales starting to realise it had a gambling addiction and that was the government, not the people. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yes, the, um, um, it's also really interesting that in around that Edwardian period, there is a reaction um, against gambling. So there's some quite restrictive legislation that comes in around 1906. Um, and you see it, I, I'm really interested in, in why it is that something that starts to happen in England or America um, also gets its reflection we think of that as being a modern phenomenon, but it's quite clearly the case. Mm. So there's a mm. there are, as a sense that that there are things out of control. Uh, so there is quite strict um, gambling laws. Um, so John Wren, who I haven't mentioned, but who made his uh, fortune as a as a gambler and eventually as a racing entrepreneur, um, his famous Collingwood Tote, which was a, an illegal operation, mm. ran for many years until the 1906 legislation finally closed him down but um he he branched out into running running private race courses and uh, 
it's fascinating to think that we used to have in Melbourne oh, a dozen uh, privately owned race courses in that period up until the 1930s. Um, so uh, there was a lot of a lot of racing that took place uh, around Melbourne in that period. Yeah, yeah, and John Wren certainly. I mean, it's an yeah. extraordinary story, isn't it? Um, yes. All those police raids and and that complex in Collingwood that was just about impenetrable. Wonderful right. stories. Now, someone has asked, um, Andrew, why Tuesday? Was it just so that we could get a day off? <laughs> oh, yes, I'm sure it was exactly that. Uh, it's, a, it's really interesting to see that when the first Melbourne Cup was actually run on a Thursday, um, and so the first few years, what they do is have a three-day meeting and start on Thursday, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the Melbourne Cup would be on the first day and the big race for the Saturday would be the steeplechase. Um, but the Melbourne Cup immediately became the most, um, the race that had the most interest. Now, there was a problem that um, the, uh, generally people decided that if there was a race meeting on, it might be an excuse to, to not be at work. Um, there used to be an institution in, Victoria in the 1870s called the Prince of Wales's birthday. <laughs> uh, so this is Queen Victoria's son, uh, the later Edward VII, um, and his birthday was celebrated on the 9th of November. Uh, in around about, I think it was 1875, the 9th of November fell on a Tuesday. And um, so they decided to run the Melbourne Cup on the Tuesday and on the Prince of Wales's birthday. And of course it was a, a huge success. Um, so basically they then decided, look, it, it needs, they, they liked the idea of the four day race meeting, which came into, we still run exactly the same way as we do since 1875 with the Derby on Saturday, Cup on Tuesday, Oaks on Thursday and a final day on the final Saturday. And it just seemed to, that pattern seemed to work really well in Melbourne. Um, so after a while they said, well, blow the Prince of Wales' birthday. We, can, we might still have a holiday for that, but let's just, look, it's like your question about the gambling. If you can't beat them, you join them. And if, yes. if, if your customers are not gonna to come to the shops because they've gone to Flemington, if the public servants are um, somehow feeling very ill on that particular <laughs> Tuesday, um, you might as well make it a, a public holiday. And um, so it's been a public holiday in Melbourne for a very long time. Um, and there've only been two or three exceptions in the Second World War and once when the, when the cup was rained out where it hasn't been on, on the Tuesday. So uh, it's, a, it's a novelty, but it's uh, been going for a long time, that novelty. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah. And as a non-Melbourneian, I'm fascinated that Melbourne has not one public holiday for a sporting event, but two. And yes. And well, finally, now how unusual is that? <laughs> it sort of seems to be growing. I mean, you you, you were from Adelaide originally. Well, I, right? I, I was, yeah. yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and Adelaide, they, they did at some stage start to, to uh, make sure they had a either have the Adelaide Cup on a public holiday or, or organise a public holiday for Adelaide Cup Day. Um, and some of our local um, regional towns now have their own um, Cup Day holidays. But uh, it's, um, I, I think it is a recognition that the, the Cup, of course, was hugely important to the economy. And I know governments recognised that very early on because uh, it, it, people came to Melbourne for that particular um, for that particular week and they stayed and they spent money and um, it was notorious that the um, the navy would always feel the need to be in melbourne at <laughs> melbourne cup time um, famous celebrities um, dame nelly melba would often make sure her her calendar worked so that she could be here for the melbourne cup uh, so it becomes become self-perpetuating and, um, uh, yes, woe betide anybody who tries to abolish it now. <laughs> oh, yes, heavens. Would anybody dare? I'm sure not. No. Andrew, probably we're out of time. Um, but thank you for um, a marvellous lecture, entertaining, interesting, erudite, um, everything one could ask. Um, and um, you are the quintessential expert in these matters. So thank you so much for sharing it with us today. Absolute pleasure. And thank you for the, for the audience. And uh, as a historian, I never give tips for next uh, for tomorrow's races. <laughs> <laughs>
look look to the past. <laughs> not even in a whisper? <laughs> not even a whisper. <laughs> Many thanks, Andrew. Thank you.